the last day, and in fact, we'll finish a couple minutes here early, and you can do the uh, evaluation for us. Jerry gave them to me. I'll let you turn them back into her or turn them into somewhere else. Uh, yesterday, we were talking about brazing and the question of whether a thick joint or a thin joint works best, and this is actually out of the brazing manual. Uh, they actually have two plots in here, but this is the uh, the better one probably. Uh, and it shows what happens to the strength, the theoretical strength of a actually yeah, it is a theoretical strength of a brace joint as a function of the joint thickness. And this is the tensile strength, and you're going to make a joint. Remember, I talked yesterday about you had iron, uh, high strength steel. In this case, it's 4340 steel, which is 180 ksi. And they had, this is the ultimate tensile strength of cast silver. In this case, they say 15 ksi. I think I said 10 ksi yesterday. But anyway, this is the strength of the silver. So you got a, a sandwich, a peanut butter sandwich, where you got steel on the outside for the bread, and you got silver on the inside. And you're looking at the thinness, if you will, of the peanut butter uh, silver. And so you got 10 thousandths of an inch here, a thousandths of an inch, one ten thousandths, and uh, 10 millionths over here, okay? And it turns out that you know, if people made joints, these are actual joints people made, and the strength goes up until you get to joints that are so small that you really can't make them uh, free. Now it says sound and voidless joint, but I don't think they really made them voidless over here. And these are jo joints that have imperfections. But in fact, the reason you get that type of behavior uh, and there's a plot on the page before, which is basically a similar type of thing, but it's printed, printed on a log or a linear scale rather than log scale, and it shows the strength of a joint. Once you get below a thousand of an inch thick, when you're getting into 10 to 15 micron joints, the strength starts going up. And this is a different braze alloy. Uh, let's see, it doesn't tell me. Um, oh, it doesn't tell me exactly what it is, but. Typical braze, this is a pretty good braze joint to give you 20 ksi in any case, but you can get up to 40 ksi if you get nice thin joints. And the reason for it, getting stronger joints with thinner joints, is, well, let's start with this side. It's called contact strengthening. You should have this in your handouts, this sheet. But in contact strengthening, this is the silver layer between two iron layers, if you will, or any other braze alloy between two base materials. And the base materials are stronger than the braze alloy. The braze alloy has a lower melting point um, that you put it in here. It has a joint thickness H. And you can take out, you can't quite see it, it's a lousy copy here, but you take out a little volume element from here and you expand it over here and you pull on it with sigma YY and it turns out there's friction because the it's a braze joint, so the braze alloy is bonded to the to the iron or to the base material, and so there's a shear stress because this stuff stacking up beside it. So this one's a little clearer. Uh, if you take each little volume element, this volume element, in order for it to deform, it has to push all these others out of the way. The one right here on the end doesn't have to push anything out of the way, so it could actually actually when you're pulling on it, it actually sucks in. If I was compressing, it would be pushing out, right? Be extruding out. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing here on the end to restrain this one from pulling in or pushing out, depending on the tension or compression. But this one is restrained by the material on either side of it. The one in between is restrained less so because it has less material out towards the edge. If you actually solve the differential equation, we won't do it, but you'll find that you, if the yield strength of the material is two times the shear stress, this material on the end, this little volume element, yields at the yield stress, but this material actually ends up with a state of triaxial stress. And then nothing deforms under triaxial stress. If it's uniformly squeezed or if it's uniformly pulled, the metal doesn't deform. The metal deforms when it has a shear stress on it. And pure hydrostatic stress is no shear stress. And therefore, you can just keep pulling on. If you pull uniformly in all three directions on something, it just you know keeps on going theory to a theoretical strength, you're not going to get it with no shear stress. So you actually get something which in rolling they call the friction hill, but you actually get an increase in strength, and it's rate, the mathematics works out if you solve the differential equation. The mathematics works out to the tensile strength divided by 
two times the shear strength, which is the normal uniaxial tensile strength, is goes as the friction hill is e to the minus two eta, where eta is a friction factor across the surface here. That's the shear stress that's trying to restrain this. X over h. So x over the h is the the width of this thing divided by the height. And if you you guys don't know more circles yet, do you? You haven't had that. But you're going to get it sometime this fall, probably. Uh, and more circles are a way of looking at the hydrostatic stress, uh, but we won't, we won't go into that. But in any case, so I'm not going to solve the differential equation if you haven't had the more circles and stuff yet, but you don't have to worry about it, uh, and so we won't really do the differential equation in this class, so too bad. Right? Uh, nonetheless, as you get thinner, the point is, as you get thinner joints, they actually get to be stronger. In tension, not necessarily in fatigue or shear, but in tension, they get to be stronger and there is experimental data for it. Okay, a um, couple of other things on brace joints. And actually, when you finish up the course, I realized I ended up shuffling my notes or something. Usually I do soldering before I do bracing. This year I did bracing before I did soldering. Um, there's not a big difference between the two. Uh, this is sort of a schematic, which I think I know you have in your notes somewhere comes out of the soldering manual, then it talks about the soldering process where you have a soldering iron, you typically will have an iron tin from the lead tin alloy that forms this inner metallic on the surface of the soldering iron, and that's what the liquid solder actually wets. You've got some sort of oxide contamination on the surface of the metal you want to solder. You have some flux, then you've got the molten solder, and you pull the solder soldering iron along in this direction and you leave behind solid solder after you clean the oxide off which dissolves in the flux and you put the molten solder on there and you have true metal metal contact and as you pull the heat back the solder solidifies and you end up with metal in direct contact with metal. You get over the problems of surface contamination in this case by having a flux to clean it to dissolve away the surface contamination and you get around the problem of surface roughness by having a liquid in, in between. Well, I'm showing you that, and usually I would have started with that, and then I would have later gone on to brazing, but it really doesn't matter. Does anybody know the difference between soldering and brazing? It's temperature, it's temperature. Exactly, it's just temperature. Did someone read chapter 16? Uh, How have you guys done that? <laughs> shipyard. Shipyard, okay. Good. Yeah. We learned something on shipyard. Actually, probably that last thing. Very important, necessarily scientific. Um, it turns out the International, the American Welding Society defines brazing as anything above 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Soldering is anything below 800 degrees Fahrenheit. It's the same process. In fact, silver soldering, silver base alloys, we call it silver soldering, but it's really silver brazing. It melts above 800 degrees Fahrenheit. The International Institute of Welding which works in centigrade, uses 425 degrees centigrade. Guess what, they're almost the same, okay? Um, as the, the difference. However, there turns out to be a good reason for choosing that particular temperature. If I look at, um, they, in fact, this is, I think this comes out of the soldering handbook, they call this soft soldering. And you have bismuth alloys down here, indium base alloys here, so these are the lowest melting alloys. Tin lead alloys, which are the most common alloys, melt at 183 centigrade for the eutectic, but this is the one I mentioned yesterday that, uh, where they were soldering the thing and the tin diffused away, left behind a 95 lead alloy, it goes up to over 500 degrees. Tin silver alloys, cadmium zinc alloys, cadmium silver, zinc aluminum, tin alloys, so you've basically got the whole spectrum of alloys from so for soldering, but you get above 750 and all of a sudden there's nothing until about 1,000 degrees. Nature has not given us anything in the region between 700 degrees Fahrenheit and 1,000 degrees. I mean, you get to aluminum alloys, but they, you alloy those as, about as much as you can and you drop it from 1,200F to 1,000F. And that's the first brazing alloys. And then some of the silver base alloys, if you put enough cadmium in them, you can get them down almost to 1100. And then you've got brazing alloys that go up 
15 higher temperatures. But there is nothing. You look at the periodic table, there's nothing of any import that exists in that temperature, melting temperature range. Okay? That's not to say we can't make some alloys that, that don't, but very few alloys, and certainly nothing of, that's economical. So there actually is sort of a natural barrier there to making alloys. Uh, I guess it's kind of a conceptual thing for me, but when we talk about brazing soldering, it's, is it joint made because the, the, the brazing alloy that you use kind of goes into the pores of the base metal, or the, the, the perfections right. of the surface and kind of a mechanical bond? No, it's, it's not a mechanical bond. It actually is it's surface tension. If I have two, two surfaces like this and I put a liquid out here, the, in a wet, so a wetting liquid, it'll just suck right into that joint if it's a thin joint. It's capillary action. So surface tension, surface tension will cause the stuff to flow in, whether it's soldering or brazing. And I've got to do something to get rid of the surface contamination, and I don't have to worry about roughness because I've got a liquid, and the liquid fills the mountains and valleys, right? But it's in brazing, I get rid of the contamination by heating everything up and diffusing away the contamination. Okay? And that's where you get into diffusion bonding and things like that. In soldering, I actually have to use some sort of flux, something to clean that surface in general. So then when it solidifies, the, the metal to metal contact, is, is there actually a, uh, what kind of bond is that? I mean, it's a true metal metal bond, but it's a dissimilar metal bond, and the braze alloy or the solder doesn't have very good mechanical strength. If I'm talking about soldering at these types of temperatures, and I start thinking about what's the absolute melting point, I'm in the creep regime. I mean, I used to be here, Stuart Brown used to teach a course in mechanical behavior, and he would bring a piece of solder wire in at the beginning of the class and hang a weight on it, and he'd measure and be like a 10 inch long wire, and he'd let, let it sit there in one hour class, and he'd work out the weight and the size of the wire pretty well. So the after class was about 11 inches long. And he was, this when he was teaching class on metal creep. Here at room temperature, with enough stress on it, solder alloys, and enough stress is like 2,000 PSI, it's not very much stress, solder alloys will creep. They will, they will just like silly putty. They will move over that period of time. Now braze alloys, being at higher temperatures, so these, the solder alloys are gonna be at eight tenths, nine tenths of the absolute melting point, depending on their melting point, okay? Seven, seven tenths to nine tenths, let's say, of their absolute melting point. So they don't have very good strength in and of themselves. You know, if I'm just making an electrical connection, and I don't really need strength, or if I need strength, I'll take my copper wire and I'll, I'll, I'll clinch it over, so my copper wire gives me strength, and the solder is just there to make the electrical connection. It's not bearing load. In general, you should not have solder alloys bear load. One of the advantages of braze is they're working at six tenths or less of the absolute melt melting point, and so they actually don't suffer from nowhere near as much creep unless you're operating them at higher temperatures. But at room temperature, the solders creep, and the braze alloys don't. Okay, so it's a question of, of overall mechanical strength. And how much you can, how much stress you can put on the joint. Typically, I say, I have a rule of thumb that actually works pretty well. Um, if you're below, if you're 100 degrees centigrade below the melting point of the solder. So if I'm talking about a lead tin alloy at 183 degrees centigrade, if I'm at 83 degrees centigrade or less, so I'm 100 degrees below the 183 melting point. I can probably put a thousand PSI on that joint over the long term and it won't fail. But if I'm above 83 degrees centigrade on a lead tin copper joint, or a lead tin uh, joint on, on copper, if I'm operating at 125 degrees centigrade and I put a thousand PSI on it, it's going to fail just like silly putty will flow. Okay, and that's just that's a very rough rule of thumb, but it actually I've used it a number of times. Um, and so someone comes in and, well, our solder joint failed. And the first thing I do is, what temperature you're operating at? What's the alloy? You know, are you 100, within 100 degrees of the absolute melting temperature? And if you are, what's your stress level? And every time I've ever done it, if they're above 1,000 PSI and they're within 100 degrees of the absolute melting temperature, it's a free failure, okay? It's pretty rough, you know, but it's, it works. So, 
for both soldering and brazing, surface tension that joins the two. It's surface tension that pulls it into the joint. Okay, as far as that goes. If you, if, well, first of all, if you don't clean the surface, it won't go in. It'll just ball up on the surface like uh, like water on a be uh, beating up on a wax car. Okay, but if you have a nice clean surface, the metal has a very very high surface energy. And so it wants to lower its surface energy and it will do it with whatever it can. And the best thing to do it with is another metal. So the, the liquid metal wants to flow into the joint to satisfy those unsatisfied bonds on that clean surface. The clean surface has a very high surface energy and anything you contaminate it with is going to lower the surface energy. If you can contaminate it with another liquid, with a liquid metal, you're going to have a very low energy state and that low energy state acts as surface tension, sucking, drawing the, the liquid metal in there. If you've ever, well, we can talk about, that's where I drew, drew, this, drew this for. This is, if you have two pipes, let's say you're soldering pipes together at home or soldering a valve to a pipe. And so you've got um, uh, the male and the female and you, you typically might face feed the connection, okay? You, you put the two together, you might wipe a little flux on there, which will help clean off the copper oxide. And then you'll take your, your wire, if this is my, my soldering wire, I heat the whole thing up and I just kind of push the wire in here and it melts. And as the flux cleans it, the surface tension will cause it to wet the surface and I'll end up with a nice fillet here. If I've gotten flux and cleaned things down here, then surface tension will draw it all the way down here. And in fact, it ought to form a nice fillet on the backside too. Okay. Now, some people believe this is what happened to the thresher submarine. Okay. I don't know how much you guys have heard about the thresher. I mean, was it '62 out of Norfolk or whatever? Yeah. The thresher. The thresher was on its first control deep dive. It had a sub tender up above it, and they lost power. Well, the reason they lost power is they had a flood in the uh, in the engine compartment. Okay, and when you lose power, it's not a good thing, particularly when you're near maximum operating depth. And they tried to blow the ballast tanks, but the ballast tanks were too great a depth, so that when they blew the tanks, they didn't get. I mean, the, the air was compressed because of the great depth. They didn't get all the water out of the ballast tanks because of the compressed air couldn't blow it all out at that depth. And uh, they didn't get enough buoy you know, buoyancy, and so they, well, I've heard different things, but supposedly they had a glide slope that got about close to the surface, but then not enough to hit the surface, and they just went back down. And of course, everybody's listening to all this on the radar phones, or the sonar phones and everything. And it was very, very traumatic uh, for the US Navy. Uh, they basically shut down the submarine program for about two years. And Rickover and others started what's called a subsafe. And believe it or not, the U.S. Navy led the world in quality control at that point in time. Okay, subsafe. What came out of subsafe is probably still some of the best quality control techniques and procedures and management procedures um, uh, because of the Thresher disaster. Well. It turns out some people believe that it was a braze joint on one of, them, one of the seawater piping systems. And that what had happened, and this thresher had been built up here at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. And actually I had one of the students uh, in, one, in this kind of IAP class actually did his paper on the thresher, okay? Uh, and there's a lot, there was a lot more that I learned about it that's come, that's available. A lot of it was classified, in fact I lived it. I lived in Virginia Beach back when all this happened. You know, if, if any newspaper was going to have news about it, it's going to be that one. But most of it was classified. But stuff has leaked out over the years, and actually, there's a fair amount online that's not classified. But um, they had some really lousy quality control of Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. Okay, it just—I mean, they—they they really didn't know what they were doing uh, as far as that goes. But one of the theories is that the guy didn't he? These are you know, this is a good sized pipe, and you didn't heat it properly. The proper way to heat a joint like this is to never heat the braze alloy. This was a braze rather than solder. But never heat the braze alloy or the solder wire directly. You heat the base material, and you let the surface tension draw the material in. 
And what had happened is, you can make a very good looking joint by just kind of, uh, if you're doing this with torch brazing or torch soldering, you can make a beautiful looking joint by just hitting the outside of the solder without really heating up the base material. If that base material is not, gonna, not hot, it's not gonna be hot enough to let the liquid solder or liquid braze be drawn down here. The best thing is to heat this stuff up above the brazing temperature and let the stuff be drawn down by natural capillary action. It'll be drawn into the smallest capillary. Okay, so, and in fact, Charles Hotel, the big fancy hotel up in uh, Harvard Square, uh, and they had a, a minor problem uh, a few years ago. They just installed the, uh, the chilled water system, three inch, 180 PSI uh, pipe. And the guy, the guy who soldered it, basically did the same thing that they think the guy did on the thresher. He basically put his heat to the solder and he didn't put his heat to the three inch valve, uh, valve body or the pipe. And so he got this type of joint rather than this type of joint. Well, all the strength is along here. You don't have any significant surface area just on this fillet. The strength is along here. And so they pressurize it and it lasted for about 20 minutes but every, this was the last thing they did was turn the pressure on and then they left. Okay, wow. and it's on the sixth floor and it did like five million dollars worth of damage to the Charles Hotel in the flood. I mean, this is a five star hotel, it is up on the top floor, anyway. Uh, but the same type of thing as, as the Thresher. So this type of thing happens all the time. One of the things that the, the Navy developed, and I understand, I have seen this a few years ago in electric boat, but now that I'm not allowed to go through down the ways anymore, because you have to have a need to know nowadays, right? Um, I remember going to the pipe shop and electric boat, and I did see, see this type of thing. They actually put, put a notch in one of the pipes, and they put the, the brazing alloy as a wire inside the notch. And then you heat it up from the outside, and it flows, and the guy can inspect it. If you've got, if you've got braze alloy, it forms a nice fillet on the outside, you can see that it flowed, because it went from here to there. So you at least got a joint from there to there. And if you heat it up the proper way, you should have a joint back this way too. The problem with this one is you can look at it all day long. The visual inspection doesn't tell you any difference between these two joints, right? This is supposed to be the center line of the joint. It's kind of making double duty of these things. So anyway, some people think that's what happened to the thresher. Um, I'm not sure if there's any official version yet. I thought the Roman would always require permission to do flexible sprazing. Flexible sprazing is you still got to clean the surface. If you don't clean the, the oxide off the surface, the metal won't wet. And flexible sprazing basically is where you use a braze alloy that has an active component in it. It might have a little titanium in it. Something that will eat away the oxide, corrode the surface as you're going, if you will, but a controlled corrosion. Okay? Dave wants to make a presentation at Intel today, hoping they will fund his doctoral thesis on flexless soldering. Right, Dave? That's correct. <laughs> okay. So the problem with flux is when the flux gets in there, how do you get it out? It ends up creating defects. And defects weaken the joint. So this is a, this is out of the brazing manual now, and this is a, the joint, this is just a two flat plates that someone has brazed and then they radiograph the whole thing, and here is the radiograph of that joint. And the, the dark area, I believe, is the braze alloy, just from the shape of some of these things. And the, so, I mean, the light area is the braze alloy, and the dark area are unbrazed regions. Okay, so this was this is a 50% joint, lousy lousy flow, most likely because it didn't flux well. Or sometimes you'll have little pockets of flux that got trapped in there. So people would love to be able to do this without flux, it's going to get trapped inside the joint. Okay? To show you a, here's a picture of a um, raised copper assembly, and here's the fillet. And you can't tell if that's a good joint or not, but you can x-ray it. And if you x-ray it, you can see on the x-ray, you can see some of the voids in here. And actually that's, to tell you the truth, Typical soldered or brazed plumbing joints in a house or something that's typical quality. Okay? It's probably just fine. 
It's maybe 25% voids. Now, if you're building a, if you're a submarine, you might want to have a process that does a little bit better. But the problem is the flux cleans the surface, but you'd like to get the flux out of there, and it never gets out of there completely. Okay? So you're, you're going to leave behind voids. But if you have a big enough overlap, then it doesn't matter because you've got enough bonded area. Okay? So um, the difference between soldering and brazing is nothing more than temperature. Um, the thresher um, was a quality control problem. At least they, some people think it was basically one of these joints weak because it's only got a small bonded area. All your all your all your stress is basically on a relatively weak braze alloy over a small area. And this technique is now. This thing about the Navy is about the only ones I know that actually go to the expense of machining the grooves and the pipes and pre-placing the, the flux, or not, not the flux, but the, uh, the uh, solder joint. Now, if you, if you really want to have a high quality solder joint for your home, you go with what's a, called a wiped joint. Now, uh, the people who put in one of my home for 28 years, I'm now on my third furnace. The first one was an old, uh, uh, it wasn't coal fired, but it was an old oil burner. And it just was, I mean, I replaced it the first year I was there with a nice high efficiency gas unit, which lasted 11 years of its 10 year warranty. Okay, I mean, 10 and a half years of its 10 year warranty, okay? Just out of warranty when it, when it gave up and cracked. And then I put another one in, and it lasted for 15 or 20 years, and my wife decided to buy a, a new one. A whole new system about a year or two ago. But anyway, the, the, the second system I put in, I was there when they were doing it. They were actually, the plumbers were actually making white joints. And a white joint is you start out with just a bare, you take, you take a bare pipe and you basically solder the surface. You haven't, you haven't done anything to the other. The other pipe, if you, this is your pipe, your other pipe is, this thing's going to go into, and you solder this surface. And the pipe's got to be big enough to be able to do both ones. It's a white joint because this is lead tin solder, and the guy will have a, a rag, a cloth rag. After he solders the joint, he'll wipe it to wipe off any excess molten solder. So he's wiping a 400 degree thing. It's good to have gloves on in case you happen to touch the wrong surface, okay? But you end up with a very thin layer of solder. Lead, lead tin, well actually nowadays it's tin, tin antimony or tin silver solder because you're not allowed to use lead in your pipes, okay, uh, for potable water in your house. But you end up with a thin layer, basically it's pre-soldered. And you'll do the same thing, and in that case the guy has to reach in with his finger, it has to be a large enough pipe to reach in, reach in and, and wipe the joint to make it thin. Now you put the two of them together and you don't have to have any flux. Because all you have to do is melt these two surfaces together, and they already are fluxed. So I can apply flux when I before I wipe the joint, put the solder on. I can apply flux here, put the solder on, wipe everything, and clean the flux out. And now I just got metal to metal. All I have to do is melt those two together. That's a wipe joint, strongest, best type of joint. It takes three times as long to make because you got to first wipe the first one, then wipe the second one, then heat it up a third time, right? If you just feed, if you face feed the solder by putting a wire onto the two joints that are already connected with a little flux in there, you're going to trap flux in there, but you only have to heat it up once, right? But a full white joint made properly takes three times as long, but no flux trapped on the inside. Okay. So there's various ways to do it, and you get various qualities of joint. Okay? Um, just to show you some of the levels of braze alloy. This is braze alloy families. I showed you some of the copper or the uh, solder alloy families. And braze alloy families were starting at above 425. And in fact, they don't even have any families between 425C and about 500C or about between 800 degrees Fahrenheit and 1000 degrees Fahrenheit because there are no metals that melt there. Okay. So it starts at about 1,000 degrees, and here's your aluminum silicon alloys. Today, um, 
virtually every automobile radiator is made out of aluminum. But when you were children, okay, 15, 20 years ago, all the, all the radiators except the Corvette were basically made out of copper. And the reason was, well, if you could afford a Corvette and you spring a leak in your radiator, you can spend $600 for a brand new radiator. But the problem was you couldn't repair the old aluminum radiators. There's no simple way to do it. There was no good torch soldering flux for aluminum. You could do you could do brazed <coughs> aluminum in a furnace in a production line just fine back in the 1960s, and that's when Corvette, which is looking for high performance, went to the lightweight of aluminum radiators for automobiles. But if your Corvette from 65 through about 85 or, or 90 um, uh, sprung a leak then you basically bought a brand new radiator. You just disconnected the hoses and put a brand new radiator in because there was no way in the field to take a torch and fix a leak. Whereas copper radiators, you could. And I can remember, you know, early 80s, I had a leak in, actually I think it was my first Suburban, like in 85, I think I had a leak in the radiator. And I had to fix the radiator after a year or so. Um, but it was copper, and so I could take it up to the local mechanic and. He was pretty kludgy, but he could still do it, okay? Um, what happened is in the late 80s, um, Alcan Research developed a brazing flux for torch brazing of aluminum. And so from, since 1990, virtually every automobile has switched over to aluminum radiators. Aluminum's cheaper than copper, it's lighter than copper, it works just as well. And now you have a way to repair it in the field. But until they developed a brazing flux, so the mechanics, these kludgy you know, auto mechanics, who really have never been trained in welding or brazing, but they repair cars this way, they actually can fix the radiators now. And that was the thing that kept everybody. It wasn't any technology or cost. It's cheaper and it's better, but it was just a question of whether it was repairable or not. You know, it might, most people would, I mean, people, who weren't buying Corvettes, you know, you could go get your radiator drained and repaired for 20 or 30 bucks, but buying a new copper radiator was going to cost you 500. People get really upset. So, of course, the thing that used to upset me about automobiles is when I worked for a steel company in the mid 70s, I actually was working on a new alloy, a stainless steel alloy that would allow you to, to have a, uh, uh, an exhaust pipe that would last 10 years. And typically back then, um, your exhaust system on your car would last two or three years before it would completely rust out. And it used to irritate me no end to have to go spend $300 on a brand new exhaust on a car that was you know, only a couple of years old. When I knew that for an extra 20 bucks a car, they could have chosen a material that would have lasted 10 years. Okay. And finally, in the 1980s, they did switch over to a my steel same actually first the stainless steel and then to aluminum steel um, but uh, anyway the braze alloys and they go all the way up here to palladium alloys palladium nickel alloys these are the nickel nickel boron and nickel phosphorus so we talked about transient liquid phase diffusion bonding this is what Pratt and Whitney ended up using for transient liquid phase diffusion bonding starts as a braze and ends up as a diffusion bond if you hold it there long enough and you're getting operating temperatures uh, you can get in a Transliquid phase diffusion bond with this type of braze, you get operating temperatures of 2,000 degrees, which is what your operating jet engines at. Uh, here are your copper alloys um, used for the old, a lot of heat exchangers still today, but the old radiators on the car. Here's your gold nickel alloy that we talked about that the Navy was making the molybdenum to copper welds for the cross field amplifier. Uh, so the gold alloys, silver alloys, silver solders. And you'll notice the lowest melting ones have 25% cadmium. Uh, for a number of years, the cadmium um, was taken out. You can hardly buy that alloy anymore. Cadmium is fairly toxic, more toxic than lead. And so people tried to take cadmium out of the environment. Um, and it turns out they ended up with so many bad braze joints. Cad silver cadmium is a wonderful braze alloy. It's just for brazing. It may not be good for your health, but it's wonderful for brazing. It makes very good quality, very reliable, good 
sort of six sigma phrases, okay, in terms of you don't make a lot of bad phrases with that alloy. It flows so well. And but back in the 1980s, people were so afraid of cadmium that they they uh, they quit selling it, uh, basically, you know, or you had to kind of get special permission to buy it uh, for special applications. Well, it was, it was such a loss that basically cadmium alloys are back uh, for brazing alloys. The Swedes actually um, decided the, the Swedish people are very, or the Europeans are much more environmentally conscious than we are, and the Swedes are even more environmentally conscious than most of the Europeans. They decided to get rid of the cadmium of the light switches. Okay, every light switch has a silver cadmium alloy for the electrical contacts. And if it's a 15 or 20 amp switch, you can make a 5 amp switch out of just straight silver contacts. But if you're getting the power levels of 15 or 20 amps, you need a tenth of a percent cadmium in there because you want to, when you, when you break the, the circuit, there's inductance in the electrical inductance in the circuit, and the thing would like to maintain the current, and when you, when you open the, the circuit, you could have a little arc. And if that arc sustains itself, or welds those contacts together, if you, if the, if it's a different type of, rather than a light switch, but another type of contact that opens and then closes right away, you can you can basically strike an arc, melt the surfaces, and if they come back together, you just weld in your contacts together, and you no longer have a switch. You have a part of your circuit that stays on, uh, and sometimes that starts fires. Well, it turns out the Swedes outlawed cadmium in the, in the light switches. There is nothing else that suppresses the arcing on the disconnect, as well as this tenth of percent cadmium oxide. And the Swedes were afraid that they were all going to die from the cadmium vapors in the room from turn, turning the light off, right? I mean, there might be you know, three or four cadmium atoms in the whole environment because of that. I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of ridiculously small. But anyway, they outlawed, outlawed it for about two or three years in the 1980s, and they burned down so many houses okay, <laughs> that they decided they could put cadmium back in the light switches. Okay, so. uh, there's some things that even the environmentalists have to admit are uh, worthwhile things. The last uh, little thing on brazing, um, maybe I'll pass these around. These are from the, in, the original test for the internally cooled recuperator. All you surface guys, what's the internally cooled recuperator program for the Navy? You know? I understand they solved the problem. I was brought in after the first one failed. But it's a great big heat exchanger. So that when you're burning your oil and you're blowing all this hot, hot gas up the stack and you're only going along at 5% power, you're wasting a lot of heat just blowing it up the stack. And so what the Navy wanted to do in the early 90s is they had the ice internally cooled recuperator, ICR program, which is a, I don't know, a five or six hundred million dollar program. They were going to build a big heat exchanger so that the exit gases from your, from your uh, from your boilers would preheat the air coming in. If you preheat the air coming in, then you're not using energy to, uh, you're, you're taking your waste energy and preheating the incoming air, which means you don't have to preheat the air as much and so you burn less fuel. And this was actually at 5% you know, uh, maximum power, this was gonna look like double the efficiency. And so you'd have twice as much time out on duty station. As, as I understand it, when you get these groups this is in the days when the destroyers had to come back to the carrier to refuel. But if you're worried about the Soviets uh, back in the old days, your your group, your battle group might spread out for 100 miles, right? And so therefore, it turns out that some of these smaller ships were spending 30% of their time just going back for fuel, back and forth for fuel. They weren't spending very much time on station. So you could actually significantly increase your time on station if you could uh, use an internally cooled recuperator. Recuperate the heat that you're blowing up the stack. Well, they so they built one of these things, and it was to it went into test. It was built by Westinghouse in San Jose. Was it San Jose? No. It was managed by Westinghouse in San Jose. The recuperator that brazed those are pieces of, of that were cut out of a system that was three times the size of this room. The heat exchange is about three times the size of this room. Uh, and it's got two different flow things, and they braced off to the stainless steel together. And they were gonna um, put it, they put it in test. They went, took it over to Rolls Royce in England because they had a, a marine turbine 
uh, test cell, and it was supposed to last for 100,000 hours of operation. And so far as I could tell, it lasted for two minutes. Okay? <laughs> and what happened in this case, it wasn't a problem with the brace joints, but the whole thing was all brazed at once. Actually, the, the components that were brazed were about half the size of this room, they would pipe them together and stuff. But they made a number of these things and put them together. But no one told that this was in the early 90s, peace was breaking out, the fence budgets were going down, and they had to save some money. So they decided rather than doing a full 3D heat flow model of the gas going through these things, they decided a 2D model would be good enough. And it turns out no one told the gas it had to flow through the heat exchanger in a symmetric form. Okay? And so the gas didn't go through this three-dimensional labyrinth symmetrically, and it just took two minutes for everything to heat up and twist itself into a pretzel. And we had, you know, we had like four to six inch thick solid steel pieces that were holding this thing together. And they just twisted from thermal, thermal stresses. So you can't fight the thermal stresses. Now people have been using recuperators in the stationary power industry, you know, big utilities, for years. The problem is they, they have, they basically start slowly putting the hot gas through a cold recuperator. And they bring it up to power in 30 to 60 minutes. So they minimize the thermal stresses. The Navy had a requirement that you had to have it up to power in 60 seconds. Cold start to full power in 60 seconds. A little severe, okay. So you can electrically heat the, uh, the exchanger before they turn the engine down. Well, you could, but it's you know it's the size of a small small house, right? I mean, it's a pretty pretty good size heat exchanger. Um, I I've been told that I'm, one of the guys in the class last year or the year before told me that the ICRs are in service and they solved the problem. I was brought in with a team of people to try to figure out what caused the problem. And like I said, if you looked at the data, you could just see you could see the leakage starting between the brace joints as they were being popped within two minutes. I mean, if you look, you know, you're kind of looking at, you know, the, the heat in and the heat out. And I, I could, what I saw was you had a nice rising slope and it started bending over after about two minutes. And that's when the first, first, first joints were started breaking apart. And they weren't bad joints. They just, you know, you take something and you, you twist it hard enough, it'll break. But apparently they've solved the problem. So, I don't know. You guys know more than I do. Um, other than that, I guess you have to watch most of the rest of the stuff on, on video, and I'll see you later. You have to do a uh, evaluation here. Thanks.